yes. tech. Thank you, Nigel. Well, this is what we've got in store. Uh, I'm going to do a bit of uh, messing about here. I was at CES. It was quite an event as usual. I've been going every year. I always go, uh, uh, go after the gadgets and what gadgets are turning into. I, my background is in mobile, so I'm quite interested in what people are carrying around with them and what they're doing with it. More and more, it's what they're doing with it that's the most interesting thing. Uh, this is kind of the topic tonight. Uh, so first of all, general impressions. OK, I've been going for a number of years. About three years ago, there was a lot of gadgets. Wearable technology was a big thing. Everybody had. In fact, there were 100 fit, uh, fitness uh, trackers and so on. I just, as a guy who really is looking at things from a business perspective, from an investment <coughs> perspective, I just said, gee, that's too bad. Uh, 98 of these aren't going to be around much longer, or they're going to be part of something else and whatever. So uh, this year, uh, Vegas and CES was huge. Uh, again, 180,000, just under 200,000, I think. Uh, it takes over the city, which is really difficult, because um, getting from point to point is, is really quite difficult. Um, Lots of enabling technologies, and Terry says I'm a ga gizmo gadget guy, and I am really, but I'm looking for the bigger picture normally. So there's a lot of enabling technology there, uh, but big deal. Uh, you know, we don't need technology, we need solutions. And what I saw this year was uh, really moving towards consumer focused solutions. And it's a consumer electronics show, consumer focused uh, innovations, but solutions, things that people would look at and say, I can use that, wow. And they don't ask how it works anymore. Uh, what's quite interesting about the enabling technologies is all the bits and pieces, we can throw them on the table. They're tiny, they don't take up any power, they can be connected, uh, inherently connected. And uh, people just take those bits and pieces and apply them to something they know very, very well. So it was driven uh, much more by sector experts. When I went to M Health places, I talked to doctors or people that really understood medicine very well and how uh, the medical community operates and how they could operate and how consumers are taking this stuff on board. So uh, there's a lot of consumer-driven change. It's happened, in, it's happened in the music industry. It's happened in just about every industry. And it's driven by what people are doing with the things they're carrying around with them. Uh, there were two. Every year they have uh, technology zones, which is great. If you're interested in wearables, if you're interested in M Health and fitness, there's usually a zone. They shuffle all of the companies into it. And you can go there and spend five minutes or a day depending on how interested you are. The point is you can see a lot in one place. This year there were two new technology zones, augmented reality and virtual reality. There's always been bits and pieces of technology, but now we're starting to see real solutions. And in my opinion, AR, augmented reality, is about applications. And virtual reality is about content and storytelling, hopefully. Uh, there was quite a lot of focus on personal video. Uh, all kinds of things that people are doing. Um, and a lot of uh, educational stuff that was very, very interesting. And when we get into some of the robots and drones and some of these other things, you'll see this education or educators are taking some of this on board. and doing something useful, stuff that's intuitively useful. You can almost look at it and say, oh, wow, you know, that's great. Uh, everything's connected now, so everything. And some of those things are very tiny. So tiny things are connected one way or the other, and they report up to something you have in your pocket, which reports up to something else. It's all kinds of the, the architecture. Uh, and the, the way it all fits together is kind of already defined. Everywhere you go, 
It works anywhere in the world. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting is uh, AI, artificial intelligence. I hate acronyms like that, but artificial intelligence was kind of everywhere. Every time I looked at something, I said, somebody that knows something has put intellect and intelligence and expertise into that and made it automated. So that's different from having a tracker that tells you how many steps you did. This is more about well-being, your health, and so on in that particular case. The other thing that's very interesting, and I'm, I'm a context <coughs> guy. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But uh, you're starting to see things that are anticipatory. So AI might mean anticipatory intelligence. It's something very close to you knows what you might want next and gets ready to deliver it or even wor uh, warns you about it. Very, very interesting to see that. Um, this is very possible that your phone will order the beers for you because it knows it's time to order the beers and your mate, even what kind of beers and all that sort of thing. So I, I knew you were going to say that. Uh, what I'd like to do is just hit some of the hot topics. I'd like to then talk a little bit about some of the areas that are much more relevant, I guess you'd say, to what's happening with people viewing content, uh, absorbing <laughs> information, enjoying entertaining things in an interactive, interactive way. So these are hot topics. Uh, they're hot topics for me. I didn't check out every screen, how thick it was, how many pixels per inch it had, or anything like that. I figured there's plenty of people doing that. But I'm, uh, words up there, uh, contextual technology, personal uh, ecosystems that actually tie this all together. Wearable is becoming a, a worn out word, wearable. But anyway, that was quite interesting. Uh, so gadgets and accessories, yeah, I'm out there looking for it. I'm looking for where, how it would plug together to do something useful or seeing how it's already been plugged together to do something useful. And last year it was just a bit, a dangly bit that somebody hung on a hook and people bought. Uh, quite interested in uh, connected devices. As I said, everything's connected, so, uh, and what I call accessories. So, not accessories like a case for your phone, but accessories that actually operate with an app. Not with a particular phone, but with an app, because Android's everywhere, iOS is everywhere, and so on. So it's the app, and the apps get updated regularly. As soon as somebody learns another angle, especially if there's money to be made in it, it gets added to it. And it's almost, nowadays, it gets added almost automatically. Uh, Okay, IoT, oh my God, every, I think every booth had IoT written on it, okay? But they ain't holding together very well, all these little bits and pieces. The technology is there. And I'm more hot on the Internet of Me, the, the areas which says, okay, uh, I don't care that everything out there, a coffee cup, whatever, can talk to each other. I just want the things that can add context to my day to talk to me, not to the advertiser, by the way. People don't actually want somebody to know a lot about them. They want something that helps, uh, that knows enough about them to bother to go get information or keep information on tap. Uh, wearables, uh, like I say, uh, it, it's a bit of, a, of an all-encompassing word. That is, there's a wearable zone, but it's all kinds of different things. Fitness and wellness also, but people that really understand how to keep you fit. Almost personal trainer type people who are taking technology and making it work for different kinds of people. Uh, digital healthcare and M health, that's an area that I'm spending a lot of time on. It's amazing what can happen, what could happen, what might happen and what people are actually bothering to do as consumers. And it's about time that some of the medical communities started taking this on board, and that's happening too. There's always the, the liability and risk uh, problem that goes with some of this stuff. But there's proper FDA-approved things for uh, uh, point-of-care devices that are actually quite cheap, almost disposable. 
Drones and robots, that was really big. That was fascinating. Unfortunately, they wouldn't let any of them fly. Oh, there were a few that had nets, air, nets up, but gosh, you've got to buy a big booth to get a net <coughs> big enough to fly some of this stuff. So it was mostly just showing off, uh, and robots. A lot of robots, but robots that do something interesting. I've, I've got a few. I'm not going to dwell on that area, but I've got a few. And the two, the two new tech zones, augmented reality and uh, 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 VR, which I'll probably concentrate mostly on VR, virtual reality, and what I call time-shifted reality. Virtual reality is kind of a, oh, a roller coaster rides and stuff like that. But is that an awful lot of reality content out there, 3D, 360, that you can get inside of, the middle of, uh, destinations for travel, whatever. Very, very interesting. And just a lot of other amazing stuff. I'm not going to spend much time on this. But I'm just saying that this is from a thing we did uh, uh, six months ago, basically looking at everything from a consumer-centric way. It's from a company, uh, they, they, the company did this chart for me for another event from First Partner. I think you can download it for free uh, at their website. But it's quite an interesting thing. All the technology, all of the things, and this, this pipe, this go, no go, uh, almost like a corporate firewall that people are starting to build or are being built for them. Ad blocking, you know. I don't want that, you know. Uh, information overload is a problem. So is obesity. But I was told by uh, my parents, uh, anything and everything, try everything, everything in moderation. So data overload uh, is information overload is about anything, everything, but relevance, context. That's the most important thing. So hot topics. We'll start at the top. Gadgets, accessories, I could do four hours on this. I'm not going to because uh, it's just everybody else covers this stuff. But something that was quite interesting uh, is these people that used to make just a lens that clips on your phone are now making whole systems that you can, uh, and with the mic, it's got a hand, handheld thing. Uh, you know, the whole thing is there. Uh, quite interesting because you can take an iPhone, it's only a 12 megapixel camera, but it's pretty good. And this is what, just one that I, that I bought. This snaps onto your iPhone for doing video. Not very expensive, quite interesting. Uh, you can buy a, a decent mics uh, to go in, all kinds of things to put on tripods. Uh, and I think that really takes uh, video and photography into a lot of places that it wouldn't normally go. Whoops. Connected uh, accessories and wearables. I put them together. I, like I say, I'm not going to uh, go into great detail. I'm going to talk about one of them. Uh, I read something that said, wearables are going to the dogs. And I certainly saw it there. I probably have 20 pictures of dog wearables that cameras let you know where they are, plot where they go. Where does my cat go all day? Oh, it's right here on my iPhone. That's where it goes. Some people want that. A lot of cameras and things inside of your house, even ones that you can remotely play with your, uh, with your pet. Uh, one had a laser beam on it that you can actually, the cat can run all over the place, or you can say sit, and if the dog sits, it spits out a, uh, a, a treat. To me, I'm a little bit worried about these things. Uh, these are the floor plans, and all the dots are the places I had marked to go to. I want to tell you about this guy. This is Edwin the Duck. Oh, it's... I was wondering where that music was coming from. <laughs> He's doing a lullaby for somebody right now. Uh, but this is a connected duck. And it's like taking all that stuff in there. And it runs with apps or without apps. Like right now, it's a night light and a lullaby. But it's got, there are books you sing along with. And when you move the duck, when you wake him up in the morning, go like that, he gets out of bed. And when you brush your teeth, uh, it, teaches the kids how to brush their teeth and so on. 
And they just uh, have a good time with it. Teach them to fold their clothes and put it away and all that sort of thing. So that's Edwin the Duck. Technology inside and connected and then an app, an app accessory. I think I hit the uh, Internet of Me, all of those things. But what comes together at the Consumer Electronics Show is the Internet of Me. Seeing things that are gathering information about me, about my body, various things, and then doing something or formulating it into something that is an answer, not a data. But what's interesting is these platforms, Android and so on, have places where they store that data. So something else can analyze that data. So privacy worries, we'll see what, uh, what happens. These were uh, home... Uh, uh, connected home <coughs> things where there was a hub that would connect anything. It had all the standards in it and so on. It's a downloadable uh, software platform, so let third parties have fun with that one. Fitness and wellness, uh, everything from aromatherapy to uh, earbuds that actually your ear is a very good place to find out a lot about you, whether you're nervous, uh, sweating, uh, anxiety, all that sort of thing, and th those are now reporting to uh, an app. This was an interesting one. I saw that a few years or a year ago. It's a little device that when you point it at something, it analyzes the, what it is. So somebody's taken that device and written an app so that you can analyze food as to whether it's fresh and how many calories are in it, in it and so on. Very interesting. It shows you, shows you on the app all about all that. Uh, digital health care. Uh, saw a lot of bits and pieces in previous years. This year, whole systems. That included storage with APIs out to perhaps a surgery, whatever, to let them use this stuff, store it, and then apply it to the customer's record. This is all forming now. I'm supposed to make this guy go. Yeah, there he is. Ah. And uh, tailor-made vitamins, even uh, medicines, 3D printing. What's right for you? Here, print it and send it to you. So that's, that kind of customization and context is very valuable. Drones and robots, I would just say that a lot of them were, were educational, taught kids with a caterpillar, put it together, and teach it how to do something, and you learn how to program. Uh, that's um, uh, Mindstorms, Lego Mindstorms, very, very interesting. I, I got a kick out of this picture. It probably doesn't come across very well, but it's that classic uh, Empire State Building picture, but all robots. I think that's a good idea that robots do that stuff. And th this uh, drone here, I mean, I saw several drones that were just very sophisticated. This is an aerial surveillance that goes up for hours and stays up there. So this is the uh, Lego. Somebody built a uh, Lego robot that takes a piece of paper, folds it, and throws it, it's a, a paper airplane. I think they'll probably find some things to do that's more valuable than that, but <laughs> and amazing stuff. I mean, this is a, uh, it's called Laundroid. Uh, it's a fold, a, a clothes folding robot. So they say that in your life, you spend more than a year folding clothes. So here comes the robots. And I just put this in here just to say something about the whole idea that these, these things are, ooh, are actually becoming the standard way of paying for things. It's, it's really quite amazing. When the banks say it's OK to use your fingerprint and these devices, then I think it's, I guess I would use it to buy something on Amazon if the bank is, or unless I can see my account starting to lose money. This is another, uh, this is kind of a, uh, one of the amazing things. I've been following Pico projectors for many, many years. But now this is one that is, produces a large screen. You take it out of your pocket. I don't have one, unfortunately. But um, it's a large, it's a smart TV. It's an Android operating system. Therefore, it can load Netflix. Uh, it's, you, it can be used standalone. It just uses, it's got a battery. It uses Wi-Fi. And uh, mirroring off of your phone or just watching Netscape, so, or anything. 
So walk into the room, put it on the bigger screen than anybody can afford in their own home, and you're away. And by the way, it does 3D. I know that's a controversial subject, but anyway, it does it. So new tech zones are AR and VR. I'm only going to spend a minute on augmented reality. Some of the things uh, that are interesting there is this is, yeah, you recognize this, it's the hype cycle uh, with everything else taken off of it. AR had its peak, it's coming down the other side, it's mostly uh, uh, basically industrial applications, it's just not a consumer thing yet. And I'm not sure when it's going to happen, but maybe it won't, maybe it will. But VR is just coming up the other side. And I, I genuinely saw that, not because of the technology, but because of the content. Content is good. I'm going to uh, show you a little bit of AR here, then we'll move on to, uh, let's see. So I've got some cards here. In fact, I've got a few if, if anybody wants to take them away. It's, the kids love them. Uh, basically, it's a deck of cards with alphabetical. Uh, every animal has an al of, of the alphabet. And uh, there's an elephant. Okay, And we've got, <laughs> we've got uh, frogs and we've got monkeys. And you know, kids really like that. You know, wow. You know, and you can make them do things because Elephants actually like to eat grass. And frogs? Monkeys. Ooh. <laughs> and the monkey, well, you all know what they do. <laughs> but the, the frog doesn't go there. It doesn't go there. It's, uh, so from an educational standpoint, there's a lot of opportunities here. To, this is a company called Octagon, who also is doing a lot of 3D, 360 shooting uh, all around the world, which is, which is really quite interesting. Uh, uh, let's see. OK. We're back where we were, yeah. So I mean, I would just say there was, I saw probably 20 of these augmented reality type devices. Uh, Google, uh, the only thing I didn't see was Google Glass. Last year, everybody had Google Glass on. This year, I only saw one person wearing Google Glass. But these have moved into the industrial area, and I don't think it's that interesting uh, for us here. Um, just a few things. Uh, Facebook, the biggest companies, are actually doing something with VR. 360, photography, the cardboard, all sorts of different things. Uh, the business of virtual storytelling, which I think is a big uh, red herring, and a little bit of BBC is messing around with it. I'm sure maybe there's somebody in here that's doing stuff with that. Uh, a lot of investment going into this. Pay attention. This is big money. Disney, Sky, investing in Jaunt, uh, 20th Century Fox is is put a lot of money into a company. Apple just bought a whole bunch of companies and so on and so forth. So this is very interesting. What I saw in the 3D 360, or should I say uh, 360 photography, with some th some of them do 3D, were anything from uh, a one lens camera to a two lens camera from Ricoh, Kodak, Ricoh. Another one uh, uh, from uh, uh, Geroptics. A three lens camera, four lens camera, six lens camera, I think. Uh, this is a, a uh, uh, eight lens 3D 360 camera that you can go on the end of a, uh, of a selfie stick. Lots of cameras, lots of GoPros, jaunt, and another one, which I'll show you in a, in a second here. Uh, Views was one that was very interesting because it had just been released. And I spent quite a lot of time with these people. This is a 3D 368 uh, camera device that could be in the middle of the table. Why is everybody turning towards the waiter to have a picture? Put it in the middle of the table. Take the picture. Or it can be, you can be walking through Piccadilly Circus or Grand Canyon or wherever. These are in the price range and the sensibility range for consumers.
whoops, back. Uh, this is an interesting one. A 36 camera. Throw it in the air. 360, 108 megapixel camera. That's pretty good. So if I was to throw it out there, I would capture everybody in here, or the police have actually looked at them, to capture a scene before all the punters get in there. Or they'll call some photographers to come and take lots and lots of 8 by 10s with circles and arrows, and something's changed. So they just, they want to throw something like that up in the air. So I'm going to declare 2017 as the year of the 360 degree selfie. That's the Geroptics device. Take the picture, send it, and let people see where you are. That's really what you wanted to do anyway. Oh, well, maybe some people actually, I, I see some people who just keep taking close-ups of themselves. But uh, Spinnable is another company that's interesting. This is a social network for 360, 3D 360. Uh, you download the app. It's a repository for all sorts of things where people put their 3D 360 selfies. And it's interesting that Ricoh, the company that made the two lens, two camera device as 360, are doing some things with them because now this is a place for that content to go. There's, I could probably put 20 companies up here where you can go find 3D and 360 content. Uh, ju just Google it, you'll find them. But this one, Colorize, has got tons there. Uh, Matavision is doing some very interesting things, which you might hear from, because uh, Anthony's on the, on the panel here. But if you imagine a, a rock event, is quite, quite interesting. I don't know about you, but everybody in America had one of those. And who said 3D didn't work? Everybody had one. And before that, they had that funny thing. Uh, but now what they've done, Mattel has done, is they've uh, actually made a Viewmaster. There's one here. They've kept the profile. It doesn't do anything. You don't put it in and look at the things that are on it. It actually is the uh, AR marker for turning on so, uh, the content that you have bought. Um, is this, the new is this the new movie theater? This was the Samsung. Uh... <laughs> that, I only captured a little piece of it. It was like 270 degrees of people. Uh, <laughs> now, what else I saw there was a, some things that you could put onto the four legs of your couch or your easy chair that did that with the right content and software. So you're sitting there. And you didn't buy a chair. You didn't buy anything. You just bought these little things, uh, the actuators, I guess they are. And a lot of attention been paid to, to stereo uh, audio, which is very important in this area. So it can happen. Um, this, to me, just doesn't do it for me. I mean, it's just. You know, they always have somebody up there that's doing this and so on. I, I don't know. Where is the people going to have these in their home? I don't think so. But one thing I did do, I got invited to the HTC Vive demonstration. I slapped on one of those. I was in a room that was 15 by 15. Uh, I was completely in an environment, not the one you see around me there several environments, and I was totally comfortable. I never fell over. I never lost my balance. I was making a cup of coffee, and I opened a, a virtual refrigerator, took out a container of milk, dropped it on the floor, and without taking anything off or anything, reached down, picked it up, and poured it into my coffee. Very, very comfortable. Uh, quite amazing, actually. So I'm going to kind of sum up here. And unfortunately, this isn't visible, so I have to read. Uh, maybe I can't even see it. Uh, virtual reality, the virtual quality is abysmal. Now, I think Steve certainly has at his disposal some unbelievable video, 360 video content. But most of the stuff you see and you have, have seen, perhaps, is pretty bad. Uh, 
the, the chords that seem to be inherent. Not in something like that where you put your phone into it, but things that, uh, that you connect up to and so on. They're very, very un unwieldy. I guess I'll skip through this because run, we've run over. But uh, the bottom line is most of the bits and pieces are there actually to do it right. But this is the big one right here. Storytelling language just hasn't been cracked yet. And the genres that this medium works in. Rock concert? Yeah, I can see it. I can see it. But, you know, I, I don't know whether a, a, a fiction novel is going to work. So I'll just uh, leave this as the final note. Uh, video storytelling on any platform, is that the new, is that the new objective of, uh, of an industry or some other industries? Uh, any device, uh, something that gives you viewing pleasure, something that's easy to view. I've got a lot of things here that uh, I didn't go into, but you know, just the fact that you can put that in front of a phone and get a very good 3D, 360 experience just by going like that. You don't need to be, have it all excluded. We've got devices here that clamp onto a, uh, this clamps onto a, if you've got a telescope that you look at the moon with, you put that on it and you put your phone on the other side and you're taking pictures of the moon. Uh, just all, all very, very interesting and rewarding is for me to see it. Uh, the capturing and the producing of it is, a, especially the producing side is a bit tricky. What genres work? Do you entertain? Do you inform? But I think the bottom line is storytelling. So I'm going to move, move over to the middle. And uh, I guess Nigel is going to come up now, and we're going to have a panel to debate some of this stuff. We, we can all see vaguely? Right. I, I'm going to um, sit down. We're going to reflect on what we've just seen, what we're going to talk about. Um, and in particular, we're going to reflect on how is this relevant for the TV industry. Now, Ken went to CES this year. I have to confess that this is the first time in eight years I didn't go to CES. And I didn't go to CES specifically because of all that stuff. Um, the CES as a show sometimes comes towards us in the TV industry. We go to CES for some years. There are new screens, um, new consumer devices that allow TV to be distributed. And some years CES goes away from the TV industry. And I made a decision this year that the TV industry um, wasn't being focused on. However, that doesn't mean to say I'm rejecting everything we've seen. I have to say I'm an absolute believer in virtual reality and augmented reality, the Internet of Things, all within their context. And what I'd like to do tonight is discuss context, I'd like to discuss TV, and I'm going to ask in a minute, I'm actually going to start with you, Martin, just to be honest, okay. give you some warning, um, <laughs> to, to ask what you saw from the list of things that, that Ken showed us, this cornucopia of, of new technology, what, what caught your eye, what excited you, what made you think that may have some relevance? Yeah. Because, because I'm conscious what we saw there was an absolutely fabulous, <laughs> by the way, um, summary of a huge show. So how you managed to get to summarise the, the, the madness That's of 5%. CES <laughs> in, in some slides, um, I don't know. It was absolutely brilliant. And what you also showed us was a full spectrum of technology from things, the, the, the most far out, internet-connected um, network ducks, at, at one end, through wearables and Fitbits and, and, and wearable clothes, through the Internet of Things, through to things which felt much closer to us <laughs> in the industry. This lullaby is driving me crazy, so see <laughs> well, Once you started talking about 360 cameras and drones and filming and virtual reality and AI, I felt you were coming towards us in industry. Um, so I, I love reveling in all the, the stuff you talked about, but, but I started to feel there were some things that, that were and weren't. And I think the great thing about CES is you can go and revel in some fun stuff whilst pulling some of the things out that, that are relevant to the industry. Um, we have with us on a panel a, a, a mixture of people. Obviously, Ken has joined us from, from the stage. Um, and we also have, um, sitting next to me, um, we have Martin Suka, who I've put next to me because I kind of feel like this is the TV end of the panel. I may <laughs> be wrong and I may be unfair. Um, as you'll see from the listing, Martin is head of production and innovation. I'll get him to just explain a little bit more what that means. Um, next to Ken, 
Um, we have Cyril Magzia. I've been practicing. Have I, have I got that right? Yes, yes I have. Yes, I, I'm yes. pleased. <laughs> now, I, I'm, now, Cyril has been very unfairly branded as digital native <laughs> or youth or, or or token young person or or token person who we think probably lives in the world that, that Ken has just described. And again, that that may be very unfair. And in a moment, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to ask you. What, what your reflections were, just just joining from what you saw and what interested you both on a personal level and potentially on a, on a career level. Um, and then um, sitting next to Sorel, we have Anthony Caridis from um, Matty's Vision, who um, you're probably near a Ken's camp in, in the world, given the, what Matty's Vision does with AR and VR. So um, well, we'll come to you last. Maybe a... closer to TV people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm notionally assuming the conversation will drift to TV, mm. yep. to, to normality <laughs> through Cyril, and then back to, to, to some madness and some VR and some fun yep. stuff. We'll revel in it. Um, I also just want to stress, um, um, not to contradict Terry <laughs> saying this is a two-act play, but actually it is a three-act play, because um, at the end, when we break up, please don't all rush to the door, um, because over on my right and, and your left, um, Steve Dan is there from Amplified Robot with his team, um, and they have some really fun things to look at. So I, I would um, exhort you, before running out the door, um, to grab a, um, a coffee and, and just go and have a look at um, what they're demonstrating, because you'll get a chance to, to, to see some, some visualizations for some of the stuff that, that is Ken has hinted at. So as I say, please don't run away. Go and have a look at the Amplified Robot stuff um, at the end. There's actually some things to fondle here as well and ah. try it. <laughs> And I've got a few decks, <laughs> decks of the uh, cards uh, that I, at least a few, some people will be able cool. to so, so we're take away. To, it's invited to come and fondle the connected duck. Yes, right. Okay. And you don't get that at many TV conferences. <laughs> <laughs> it's connected. It can report you. By okay. The <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so first off, I'm, I'm going to throw this to, to Martin. Yep. That was fun. What did you think? What did you see? What excited you? Um, well, well, all of it, actually. And, I mean, it's great because you, you look at these things and you think to yourself, oh, wow, we can embrace that and we can use that in telly and we can do all these sorts of things with it. But then you sort of go, oh, wait a minute. And then the reality strikes a bit and the practicalities of it strikes. And you go, actually, in a sort of a mainstream um, broadcast programme environment, how can we use them? Because quite often what happens is we try to shoehorn them into what we're already doing. Mm -hmm. And actually, to get the best out of them, you have to use them in their own sort of environment, in their own context, and in their own right. So therefore, the two things don't quite come together. Alongside that, you know, budgets going down, time scales are shrinking, and, all this, and these things have to have time given to them to get the best out of them. And often, we haven't got that time to do it. So when you look at those things, you think to yourself, we could start using it. I mean, drones is an example. I mean, look at how the use of drones has taken <laughs> off. And we get those other shots and so on. And quite often, they add great context. They give you that other shot. They give you those sorts of things. But quite often, they get used for the technique themselves. And that's where it gets in the way of storytelling. That's when it starts. the technique starts to take over. And that's the problem that I think you have with it. In terms of what really caught my eye, it's actually the, the iPhone with the lens on it and the light and so on. Now, again, you look at that and you think, oh, fantastic, we can start using that, we sh start shooting programs on it. Well, actually, we've got this little thing called technical standards. And unfortunately, they don't come up to it. So you go, OK, so where can we use them and where can we get value out of them? For me, that was the thing that caught my eye because a lot of the productions go out casting members of the public. <clears throat> and actually, well, they want to bring that back and they want to show that to some of the execs and they want to show that to commissioners and that sort of thing. That's where those sorts of things come into their own in those sorts of program environments, I think, where you're sort of using them and you're using that new technology, which is consumer-led, in that professional environment in the right context and in the right place where it fits. So I think that's, that's sort of the excitement. That's where it goes with, okay. with those. I'm things. going to come back later on and, and talk about storytelling in more detail because I, one of the things I wanted to explore with the panel is this idea of um, a personal video experience versus a television experience um, yeah, and, and how those things differ. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going to um, throw an unfair question at you. Um, our <laughs> digital native, <laughs> poor, poor Sarah, is carrying so many labels here. You know, you're the, you're the youth <laughs> vote, the normal vote. Um, first, of all, first of all, without commenting on the TV industry part of it, as you saw Ken's demonstration of that kind of spectrum of technology, what, what things just excited you and, and, and made you think, oh, I want to try that? Um... First of all, so many exciting, cool things that I was kind of like, what's going on? I'm not too sure. 
Um, but I think the main thing for me is the stuff I can use on my phone because I'm always with my phone. It's the thing I use the most. Anything that I can sort of put onto my phone or with my phone, it's sort of the thing that I want to carry around with me. So the lens, the light, all the sort of accessories and the gadgets I can use with my phone are probably the things that excite me the most, um, especially the 3D, 360 selfie. Yeah. That's really cool. Like if I'm on holiday or something, I would want to take a selfie of myself and sort of be able to pan around. So I think things that I can use on my phone would be the things that... Yeah. And, and I was going to ask, um, for me, video was never part of my normal day-to-day -day expression. As a kid growing up, you know, I had a Super 8 movie thing. You had, we had to send our, our little films off to Hemel Hempstead to get them um, um, <laughs> yeah, film, de developed. Yeah, yeah. Like dreadful roundabout, yeah. yeah now, now, as someone who's over 50, my perception is that that day-to-day -day use of video is becoming part of the, the, the natural exchange between people and the natural communication mix. So are, are you looking at this stuff and thinking it kind of democratises your use of video and, and just your day-to-day -day use? Yeah, it, I mean, like you're saying, video is a lot more into what we do now. Um, mm. I mean, Twitter's in, introduced putting videos on there and you can put things on Instagram. So I think having gadgets that make it easier for you to put good content that kind of not really look professional, but look like you've spent time doing it helps a lot. Um, yeah so, yeah. so so the idea of a 360 camera thing you can hold up is it's not science fiction to me that stuff when i when i was your age that was science fiction this is just yeah i want it i want up my phone now yes if yeah. it's simple to use okay because i think once it becomes confusing it's just kind of like oh i don't have the time for it but if it's easy and accessible and it looks interesting it's something that definitely i would want to use that was one of the things i picked up from from your speech game that actually what you seem to be saying is a lot of the stuff that a few years ago was um, R&D concepts at CES mm. was suddenly consumer tech. You, you could buy the stuff in shops. This, is, this isn't really futurology. This is the, the high street in the right that's, shop. That's the point. I mean, yeah. that's what's, what I saw this year. I've been watching this stuff for 15 years, and so have you, actually. Uh, well, several of us have. It's just not been ready for prime time up until, I think, about a year ago. I looked at it, I, uh, uh, roller coaster rides I love, but not the ones uh, inside that thing. Um, but now I'm seeing what I call time-shifted reality, not virtual reality, time-shifted reality. Get yourself into another environment. And I know that begs the question about what happened to the couch potato mm. family that sits there and enjoys, well, in my house, uh, if there's more than one of us there, we're not necessarily all doing the same thing, but we like being together. But uh, some of the, I think that's a barrier. There's a lot of barriers to this, but it isn't the technology. It isn't the quality anymore. Uh, it isn't the viewability. I mean, this little thing here with the phone and two lenses, if somebody wants to come up and have a look at it, you'd be very surprised that you can look around in 3D, 360, and fold it up and mm. put it in your pocket. So if somebody sends me a 3D, 360 selfie, I could actually look at it anywhere, anytime. And then that's suddenly, the, that's just consumer tech. That's what yeah, we just expect. The real question here is about storytelling. Mm. You only have to look at what people put on Facebook from YouTube and see a distinct total lack of storytelling. Mm. I mean, these cats doing all these different things and so on. What's the story? You yeah. Know? Hey, we were in a market but, channel five. Don't worry, we understand that. <laughs> yeah. so. The other side of the coin is, Storytelling was in the realm of the industry that hired people who were good at it and sent them out with very sophisticated equipment. Maybe there's some mm. really, really good storytellers out there okay. that and sh we'll share. So, final intro to the panel. I was going to same intro question. Of yep. the things you saw, um, what excited you? First thoughts? Sir? I like all of them. <laughs> yeah. Now, why do I like all of them? Because I think they give a new, uh, a new kind of opportunity to everybody to produce content. Because I think really whether they will stick or whether they will be forgotten will be simply a matter of content. And I agree with the storytelling uh, issue. I think if storytelling is successful and if it works, people will, will keep using them. And most of them are gadgets really, but one button gadgets that you press one button and they work. They're not difficult, that you don't need to be a professional photographer to use them. 
uh, pictures will be, on the average, pretty good. If you have a 360 image that you can scroll around and uh, see what was behind you when you actually were in this beautiful place, and most probably you have forgotten some of it, that's good. And as I remember from our own childhood, the, the pictures that we have in our albums, many people today don't have pictures in albums, but we didn't really care whether the pictures were crisp or good or focused or not, you know, shaky. We love these pictures because we remember how the place was through the little cues that we find in there. And I, I'm sure that everybody is happy to have a blurry picture than not having a picture at all. <coughs> so all these gadgets, I believe, they are very good, but we will expect to see content coming out of it. Okay. And it will become more and more important if we move from the conversation of uh, uh, how the individual will treat this to how the television people will treat them and what the television in general as an industry, uh, as a program maker and distributor, can give back to the people. Okay. By using gadgets, not maybe so simple, maybe more sophisticated, but it will be this kind of gadgets. Now, I'm, I'm very conscious that we work in an industry that can concoct its own tech nightmares <coughs> without necessarily the, the outside help of, of, of Silicon Valley. You know, we, we're an industry that has already just pushed ourselves through the nightmare of red button interactivity, mm -hmm. the HD upgrade, um, 3D or not 3D, the, the imminent arrival of 4K, 4K over IP <laughs> or not. Um, so, so amongst ourselves, we can concoct mayhem around technology. And now suddenly we have, it feels like, a waterfall of outside technologies also arriving. And what I'm trying to tease out of here is, is which of these potentially can move into the TV industry, either by allowing, democratizing the process of creating content and storytelling and bringing that in, or within there, um, some techniques which actually may affect television making at its larger level. So are we seeing anything within here that um, in 20 years' time when you're still doing your job may have, actually, may, may have leapt up and actually started to affect mainstream TV? So if we look at um, virtual reality, augmented reality, do we think this stuff is actually destined more for the games industry? Or are we starting to see some things or techniques or technologies that could actually come up into, the, into TV production? The, the trouble is, you never can tell, can you? I mean, you don't know of, of those things which one is going to take off. I mean, everybody thought that 3D really was going to take off, and it didn't. It didn't really go anywhere. Um, and was that the way in which it was used? Did we approach that in the wrong way? So, I mean, to be able to predict which one of these is going to take off, I think, is, is just as difficult. Because it could be that the 360, for example, the 360 view, could take off in one sort of genre or one environment, but not in another. If we try and force it into another, and there is a reaction against it, is that going to stop people from going? I mean, the whole 360 thing anyway, I mean, people have got used to that because, I mean, Street View, Google Street View, you can pan around, you can do all that sort of stuff. That, that's fine, and people are used to that. Do they want that in the context of a television program? Um, and if so, what type of television program does that lend itself to? It comes back to the storytelling thing. Because if you put the power in the, in, in the hands of the individual, the viewer, to then say, well, actually, I'm just going to pan around this scene that the actors are in and see what else is going on, you start to miss nuances of the performance and all that sort of thing, which has been hopefully carefully crafted. So storytelling becomes a completely different context of how that story is told. And once you put the power in the hands of the viewer to do what they want with it, and I think that's the difficulty. Now, if you're in a news environment or a sport environment where actually you sport. want to mm. see what else is going around, then that's probably the great, a great place to use those sorts of things. Mm. So I think it's about getting it right in terms of where we use it, and as I say, not trying to shoehorn it into those areas where actually it's going to inf interfere with the viewer's experience. I mean, you, you, you almost want to use it in the context of enhanced experience. So you can say, actually, if you've seen that and you want to know more, you can go here and you can get more because now you can do the 360 degree pan. And I think that's the way that we need to use these things. But they need, need to be used, I think, very carefully and very considered. Yep. And I think that's the thing where it comes into the whole thing again around time and actually having the expertise and the experience to know how to use them and what to do. I mean, part of the problem with 
3D was that, you know, in movies it was fine. We have the time, we have the money to spend on getting every shot right. You don't necessarily have that time to do that on a live show. So consequently, you take all your close-ups and their beautiful depth and all that sort of thing, and then you cut wide and you lose all that depth perspective. Um, and, and then it destroys the illusion. So it's about, I think, putting them in the right place to make them successful is what this mm. is key to. Is, is part of it our expectation of interacting with, with television? So I was going to throw a question at you in a minute, so about um, a news story. For us, I, I grew up with, with very stilted news bulletins. I would watch the news at 9 or news at 10, and the news was presented by someone sitting at a desk, and then it would cut to um, a camera, a very static camera in the field. Clearly, since my youth, the ability of the people in the field to deliver much more dynamic, fast-moving content into news stories has changed. And I, I wonder, are we just on a continuum where you, you know, ten years on, you, you would just expect to be able to see a news story about a breaking thing, uh, the the Arab Spring, you know, a news story from the middle of Tahrir Square, and actually the expectation is that you would just want to be able to immerse yourself in the in the video. Um, I mean, are we? Do we think we're on a kind of a journey towards the expectation that I can just zoom into that video, I can flip the video, I want to see that bit of the story? Is it? Are we just kind of stilted in our in our views because we grew up in a very stilted TV world? Do you think? I think that when it comes to immersing into <clears throat> television, like you're saying about storytelling, it's you've kind of got to get the balance between should the viewer have the option or should... Because from the perspective of um, news and sports or live shows, it would be great to really get in there and see everything that's going on and really have the control of seeing your surroundings and being in that sort of environment. But again, from the perspective of acting or something like that, you don't want to sort of take away from the story and the, the time and effort that's gone into it. Um, but I do think that we're kind of getting to a point where if I was watching the news and somebody was saying, this has just happened, I would want to see what is going around, you know? What's, what, what are they talking about? I don't want, oh, I've just seen this happen. I want to see everyone. I want to see the reactions of people. And, you know, I do mm. think we're kind of getting to that point. Um, so, yeah, I, I, whether it's a good or a bad thing, I don't know. But I do think it's mm. going to progress to that sort of point where it's just expected to have the option to see your surroundings. Now, I'm a rugby fan, um, and I, uh, having done research into interactivity and came, came up with a very clear idea that consumers didn't want to interact with sports, at the weekend, we were watching live Six Nations on my Skybox, and at various points, we had paused it and rewound it, and we were all crowding around the telly, pointing at, <laughs> did he score? I don't know, you can't see from this angle. He, he definitely put the ball down. No, he didn't. And, we, and I was thinking, I've just, I've just told the industry in the last few years, nobody wants to interact with live events and sport. And we've paused the sky, and we're all pointing. And I was thinking, it'd be great, actually, if we just let this run. And we could have been interrogating some video on here. So, so there we were, disproving my, my idea that we didn't want to interact or mess around with live video, arguing about whether a man scored a, a try or not in a live <laughs> rugby game. So I, I'm, I'm opening up to the idea that, actually, on occasion, for the right reason, and the right outcome. I may want to interact with, it, with this stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to ask about um, the, the virtual reality and the augmented reality type yep. of stuff. Is, is, do, do you think it's news and sport that can seep this stuff into the industry first? Or I, I think we have to, to approach this in a much wider perspective. And we can look back in history, for example, for, for a couple of ideas. Uh, if, we, if we restrict all these new technologies to the areas or the, to the genres that seem to be the obvious ones, or the easy ones, we may be missing what has happened in the past. For example, let, let's consider what happened when the first cameras came around. People were watching theater. So they came with one camera, they put it in front of the theatrical play, they left it there, and they simply recreated on film a theatrical play. And then we fast forward today, and we think of a film like Inception, and what's the connection between one camera in front of the theater play to Inception, which is an incredibly complex story with multiple layers and time being shifted front and back and lots of eerie stuff. So I think we are now in, in the infancy of an industry that gives us opportunities that we don't have the scripting capability to take advantage of. For example, it's very easy to see one 360 camera in the middle of a field with players running around it and throwing balls. but can we think of, of, of a, of a long-form play 
or, or, or fully cinematic um, artwork that takes advantage of, of this 360 capability. And I think we will need, first of all, to look into storytelling, wait for clever scripting to come around with new ideas, with, with new kind of content produced, and then everything will start falling into place. At the moment, we are trying to recreate experiences that we know in another format and in another medium that most probably is not the right one. Because if I want to, to, to watch this panel, I'm not sure I want to have a 360 view of it. I may have a 120 or 180 degree view of it. But if I wanted to, to watch what the, the people in front of us uh, think about us, um, I could do this with another view, not necessarily with the same camera. Uh, or uh, as we have seen in, in recent works that we did when we live streamed uh, events like the EMAs from Milan, if you put too much control in a live event on the viewers, maybe they actually lose from the experience. Mm. Because if you have a professional that knows how to select the, the real interesting stuff and only allow the, uh, the viewer to have uh, interactivity where it really matters, it will enhance the experience instead of reducing the experience. Mm. So I think it's a matter of uh, coming to a next generation of uh, script writers and um, storytellers. We will only be going back to storytelling because content has to be adapted to these technologies. And it's, good. it's not going to be the same content that we are watching today. Right. So I mean, this, this is the view I can... And actually what happens when, when you take that on to the next level is that now everybody's viewing experience is, is completely different. Yes. So, you know, yes. that episode of Coronation mm -hmm. Street or whatever it might be, when you go to work the next day and you say, oh, did you see what Ken did? Uh, no, I didn't. I was watching what, you know, yeah. Billy yeah. did or whatever <laughs> it was um, because they, they've got a different... So, yeah. so it's, there's no longer that shared experience because everybody is experiencing something from their own personal point of view and it's different. And you're right. I mean, being able to cleverly write for that to happen but still be able to sort of portray the intention is, is I think, the key to the whole thing. But you can go back and look the other <coughs> way. You can. So if you like episodes that people watch over and over again, it's because they went to work and somebody said, did you see that? But it was that I look on the look. person's <laughs> face. I think that's key. I mean, some of the serials that we're binge watching right now, you try to figure them out. They're quite complex. And some of it's down to facial expressions, yeah. things like that. I mean, I don't, what I'm hearing here is that the, the exciting thing is that for the industry to want to do any of this, it was great expense, great experimentation, huge investment, and so on. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. This is coming from the grassroots up. So in some ways, consumers, digital natives, will define some of the things that are actually interesting uh, yeah. to, to people, un unbeknownst, really. And I mean, I like your, I mean, basically, I like when you said, I just buy all those things because they go around my camera. Well, that thing, that other than the lens, everything are just a, a piece of plastic that clips on there that allows you to put a tripod or slide a, 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 a light in. Which light doesn't matter. It's, it's a standard fitting and so on and so forth. So this is stuff that, I don't know, I think consumers can really run with and take with them on holiday. Now, you showed in your videos um, a scene of the Samsung stand. Uh, it was good fun. Everyone had virtual reality headsets on. They were sitting on vibrating chairs. Um, and um, it reminded me of some of the early 3D kind of experimentation. I remember sitting at home with the family with the glasses on. Um, and I'm, I'm conscious sometimes that a lot, it feels like a lot of the technology innovations pointed at the TV industry um, are very often pointed at us from a, a tech community um, who, who don't necessarily understand the group shared viewing experience. And we, we mentioned the kind of the shared viewing experience a moment ago. Um, and I'm very conscious that actually a huge part of what we do as an industry is about delivering an outcome, whether it's narrative storytelling, whether it's news or sports events, which, which is designed to, to, to be watched in groups, people sitting around the sofa. And actually a huge part of the outcome is actually our mutual interaction around a show. Me turning to you and saying, you see that? Uh, and very often, it feels like the tech is an intervention in that relationship. 
Um, and I, I do sometimes wonder that Silicon Valley, um, I, I sometimes cruelly say that this technology is, is developed by people who don't actually have family and friends to watch telly with. <laughs> um, and it does feel like that sometimes Silicon Valley doesn't understand what we call the, the we experience of TV. But it feels very much like the me experience of tech and not, not the we experience of TV. And so I do sometimes feel that that is often the barrier that this stuff has trouble getting over. Um, that, that actually something which delivers to me an improved shared experience um, and it might have been a 360 camera where the three, three drunken men in a, in a suburb in London can move the, the camera around a rugby ball, um, would have been great. But actually, for most of the time, we were all sitting back commenting on what we were seeing on, on the screen. And I, I sometimes wonder whether we, we just need, in TV, we don't talk up enough that shared experience, that group experience um, thing of TV. So. Yeah, I, th I think, um, I think that the shared viewing experience is still relevant. I mean, we can see that through the sort of figures that we're getting and so on. Everybody's been predicting the downfall of the, the linear broadcast transmission, and that hasn't quite happened yet. And all these other things have sort of added to it, so that we've got another sort of opportunity to see things or another opportunity or another way of doing it in a, in a way that we didn't have before. And I think it's additive. And I think this might be the same sort of thing, where, where we just add to those levels of things, that, of, of different experiences and different ways of doing things. But I think that's still going to be you know, relevant for quite some time to come. There have been a couple of things recently where we've talked about you know, the younger generation are brought up on this type of consumer technology and so on, are very used to it. And we'll spend, I mean, uh, Childwise, for example, have recently done a, a, a piece of research, which was released just a couple of weeks ago, which says that um, uh, kids between 5 and 16, I think it was, are, are spending three hours online compared with um, 2.1 hours in front of the big screen or in front of a, a television. Um, and that was seen as a significant shift, which it is. But actually, what we don't know at the moment, because we haven't had time to see these things go through, is when those sort of 11, 12-year-olds are in their 30s and got a mortgage and a family and all that sort of thing, are they still going to have the time? Or do they become like us now, mm. who go, put it on in the corner, get the tea, get everything ready for it, and just catch it in the corner of your eye, because actually you haven't got the time for that sort of single experience. Mm. It'd be interesting to see how that sort of progresses over the years as, as that new generation grows up. And do they keep those habits or do they actually change? Mm. I think it will, will be quite interesting, actually. Yeah, and, and do, you, do they become just as miserable as, as <laughs> yeah. slumped on the sofa with a glass of wine? <laughs> well, now, now, I'm going to keep asking questions because I'm having fun, but I'm very conscious that some people may want to throw some questions. Now, we, we have um, Terry wandering around. I think there's actually a question in the middle there. So if, if we, ha we have two microphones roving around, so, uh, gentleman there with the, the red tie. <coughs> um, I was interested in your comments about VR and television, and television being a shared experience and VR ruining it by uh, having the visors on, etc. I actually think that VR is closer to the experience of a book. Now, a book is a personal experience. You don't get crowds of people trying to crowd around your book when you're reading it. Uh, and books are very popular. So I think VR has a, is closer to that sort of experience and of course, then VR does give you the ability to, to tele share, to share with people in, uh, yep. not in the same room. So I think it's a bit unfair. I think TV is a can be a shared experience in one direction, yep. and VR is a different experience. And I actually, um, someone made this point to me yesterday that, that one of the great outcomes from, from <laughs> VR was um, what, what was the phrase? You, you may know it. It, it was, it was um, co viewing with, with people in a different location. Mm. It, but I think it was what you were describing. They were saying they can sit down and watch a film. And they're sitting in a room with some friends, but actually everyone else is in, in, in different cities. Um, so you, and you none can... of them are in the scene. Yeah. They're enjoying something and discussing it, like the football match, yeah. actually. Mm. Destroy, uh, d discussing it and, and so on. But I think that's going to come in time. That requires some streaming and some connectivity that's a little bit difficult now. But I mean, I, I like the book analogy, but um, there's a saying that says, give me the child till he's seven and I'll show you the man. I say, show me the man's bookmarks, and I'll show you the child of seven. <laughs> Whose bookmarks are the same? Yeah. But it isn't. It's because everybody's interested in little, and, it, and they meander down different trails. Yep. 
But, but I think, so, I, if, I, if I paraphrase, if I get you wrong, um, please correct me, but I think what you're saying is that, that VR could, it, could actually create a different viewing context that we may not have seen, where someone could, could immerse themselves in a, um, a TV experience which is designed to be watched by a single person. While, whilst we're cherishing the group viewing that we've always had, VR may actually introduce a, a new context for, um, for, for viewing a single kind of content. What I'd say, though, is you've got a new genre with a VR, <coughs> just like you have genres with books, television and radio, and a good VR experience, it might start as a good VR experience, it then would tr maybe translate to a television experience, which might be remade differently mm. from the VR experience. OK. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. And, and there's, there's, I've got two questions here, one either side of the screen. So if you can... I'll start with the gentleman while the, the lady is grabbing the microphone. Yep, the uh, uh, piece of equipment that caught my imagination is this 360-degree camera. Um, I'm a cave explorer, and I'm quite interested in the extraordinary features you see underground. So I do see the potential in using something like that. But the thing that's also important, I think, is the group shared experience. And I'm just wondering if Ken, in his travels, has seen any example where this 360-degree viewing facility has been used in a group situation or is it all down to these individual headsets you mean from an acquisition standpoint or from a viewing standpoint i'm looking at how the viewer actually sees the finished well, result i mean uh facebook youtube they've all enabled 3d 360 content and a lot of it is migrating there and there's tons of app now people will share that not that aren't in the same place i think that's that's the point here is people if you had a cave experience you might even look at it and say my God, I didn't even see that when I was down there. But it's down to the devices to catch it uh, good enough, and I think they're getting there. There was a question in, in the second row here. This Hi, um, I was actually going to combine sort of both thoughts. I wanted to ask if everyone was... Can I ask you just say who you are and, and where you're from? Sorry, I'm just... <coughs> My name's Deborah, I work at BBC. Thank you. Um, I was asking was maybe perhaps being a bit coy about everything that was on the table and if we're perhaps not looking at like a bunch of fax machines and laser discs um, in that you know they're go about to be surpassed that's always the way of technology but if we're torturing you know torturing the idea of television to try and include these things um, because I also think that there are sort of limitations the thing that does connect uh, the theatre and the TV and the cinema is we've got eyes on the front of our head we, we, we can't change that so we've got Sort of put something in front of it. So the question is actually about the electronic show and if there was anything that was created or invented by content makers first, fulfilling a lack in tools that they had to make good stories or to tell good stories, or if all of this was technology <laughs> developed because we can, which is important as well, but is now being used sort of retrofitted to trying to make mm. stories okay. for television. Well, I, I brought back uh, eight or ten Google Cardboards with brands of different companies on them. And it isn't because any one of those companies was trying to sell those things. They had them there because they wanted people to see their content. And some of it was good. And I mean, Google Cardboard ain't great, but uh, it can, it can, if content is good, you can uh, enjoy it. So I, that's what I saw this year. If I didn't express that, I'm sorry. This year I saw content. Other years, I've seen technology and techie people <laughs> just showing all of their stuff and how good it was. You, by the way, using things that even aren't good genres for this, like a roller coaster ride, okay, it makes you feel it's like 3D with something coming out and almost hitting you in the face. Uh, it's, it's sensational, but it isn't lasting content. What I see is like I say, time-shifted reality, real content that people would enjoy. Sorry, just, just to respond. <coughs> but then why, why is everybody in the room struggling with this idea of storytelling? If there was something that was invented by a storyteller who's going, gosh, I'm really having a problem getting this thing across, and I think it's fascinating, and this bit of kit or this thing that I need to, to be invented would really help with that. So that was my only question. Mm. Is if there was anyone who's struggling to tell the story they want to step to tell, trying to find a thing to help them do that. That's what I saw. Mm. There's well, people, and there's people <laughs> sitting on yeah. the panel here that are using yeah. this but because you can tell the story. Oh, I, just before we go to the question at the front, there's been a gentleman waiting um, at the back next to Terry. So uh, I'll come to you in a moment. Uh, hello. Hi, Solomon Wilkinson from um, BBC Digital Storytelling. 
Uh, firstly, uh -huh. uh, uh, I like to point out the fax machine was very useful for its short life. But um, the question I had was about the, the context of we, we viewing and me viewing, which I find really interesting, actually. And what we're seeing from gaming is that that, that people are having a Wii experience there, but the people that they're connecting with are across the world via the internet. And do you think that that's something with, you know, dual screening and, and social media, that that's something that's going to trickle down into television watching and perhaps the shared experience will be more online than yeah. at the water cooler, for example? So, so redefining our idea of what we is. We yeah, used exactly. to be the people on the sofa next to me. I think it's similar to actually to the point the gentleman made earlier on um, about how virtual reality can allow me to sit and watch telly in a different context with people who may not be there. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think Xbox, in the, the Xbox 360, they tried a, a co-viewing experience where you could actually watch a movie in a virtual um, uh, area where eight of you would sit on these round sofas, but actually your, it was your avatar watching it with, the, with eight avatars of people who, who may be in different parts of the world. Sorry, just, just about we viewing. Twitter is my we viewing. There's a hashtag. You know, we've been we viewing this with RTS Tech. Yeah. for the last hour or so, yeah. and, you know, already sharing some cracking ideas, and I do that on television. I don't always have the luxury of having my partner or, you know, a friend sat yeah. next door to me, but I've got friends, I've got people who I've never met before sharing brilliant <coughs> ideas, probably better yeah. ideas than my wife or my friends would have. <coughs> that's we, and, that, and that's already Interesting. There. That's yeah. very interesting. We will get to your question. So, so, so part, I, I like, thank you for your question, Max, on, and, and your input. One of the things we're beginning to see is perhaps we need to redefine our idea of what we means when we're talking about watching yeah. telly as a group. So, but, that, but even though those people are viewing those things in different environments at different times or whatever, and then sharing that afterwards in, in that we experience, actually, it's about what you're delivering to them. So are you delivering the same thing to each of those so that they can discuss it. Or are you delivering something different to each of them? And I think that's the crux mm. of that thing. Yeah. It comes back to the storytelling, whether that is individual or whether it actually <coughs> it is common, whether it's common or but not. Both of those may exist. There well, may exactly. be occasions yeah. where I mean, technology be changes the I nature mean, of the content yeah. and other times where technology changes the nature it's, of the context. It's like the argument between, you know, is Someone it linear broadcast down. scheduled or is it something else? <laughs> Well, actually, yeah. there's room for both to coexist, and we should enhance all of them. And, and that's what we should do with this as well, and we should enhance all of those things and say, whatever you want, actually. It's, it's not something we find it's not either or, and people tend to look in a very black and white thing, yeah. but these things can live together, different strokes for different folks. Interesting. This gentleman's been waiting patiently at the front. Yeah. Same, same thing. I hope it's worth the wait. <laughs> name, um, name I'm paper. Nigel Bristow. I'm um, a director and a writer, and my... Uh, uh, the predominant experience is kind of straightforward TV storytelling or movies. Um, although I have worked in expanded um, media. And I suppose there are two things. One is that the notion that drama is going to sit very uncomfortably with the idea that you can um, orientate yourself within it <coughs> may not actually hold that much water because there's a very popular um, kind of theater, immersive theater, um, where people get to wander around a space. Mm -hmm. It's not um, a promenade show. It's much, much more um, multilinear. Um, and, you know, audiences respond to that. It's not, that, it's not the sense that your attention isn't directed because you, you know, you, you put little carrots up for people to follow. Um, <coughs> the other thought I had was um, your question, which is really interesting, is, does the, uh, is the technology existing and then people try and figure out what to do with it? Or do um, content creators um, say, I want to do something, now build me the, the box mm -hmm. to do it? And it occurred to me that most, the most interesting stuff is when the system fails. So um, the electric guitar was basically a failed form of amplifying an acoustic guitar so that it would sound like an acoustic guitar but louder, and all the imperfections, the, the fact that it had feedback and the fact that it had overtones, et cetera, et cetera, harmonic overtones, was what made it interesting. So if you can design in advance something that's going to work, that's probably the wrong, the least interesting thing about the, um, the technology. It's when you get people Enough. to mess it up mm. that interesting stuff happens. And so I'm assuming what you're exhorting <coughs> is that, that we need to just try stuff. Try yeah, stuff, and the, push, and the, the, push the barriers. Yeah, and I think the money side of it is curious because mm. um, 
as you said, it's, it can become expensive, the whole kind of nightmare of um, mm. uh, HD, et cetera, et cetera. I'm used to turning around to TV programs on ever tighter schedules. But this stuff's interesting, because yeah. it's cheap. Yeah. That stuff's really interesting. Isn't that why we have the BBC, to spend money on absurd, <laughs> absurd <laughs> projects that no one can justify? But, so. then, but then that <laughs> comes back to the technical standards thing. And I mean, there we have to sort of drop our standards and say, OK, something from a mobile phone is acceptable for a drama, which it isn't at the moment. You know, a but broadcaster saw, would not accept but something from... we sort from of do that all the time, because, um, uh, you know, citizen journalism, et cetera, et cetera. Once upon a time, when I got into television, all this stuff would have failed the tech uh, review because it was hideously <laughs> overexposed and it was shot by, you know, or, or stuff shot by one, one man, one person crews. That stuff is, is, you know, technically, if you go back t 20 years, that's technically um, yeah, it's substandard. Mm. But we accept it. So you just need to, yeah, we, we need to lobby for that. And it's not uncommon to see um, bystander video now in, in a news story. That would have been a certain, but very yeah. slowly that crept into our experience. And if you see a news story of a fast-breaking story, to see bystander video included, yeah. you, as a viewer now, you accept it. You know what it is. Yeah. You say, oh, that, that's not broadcast standard. But actually, it's there and on the ground. I accept it. So... <coughs> David McClelland, mobile journalist. Ah, on the subject. <laughs> on the subject of. <laughs> and this, and no, absolutely. So you look at a number of broadcasters around the world are, are creating news, not necessarily drama, but news packages that are using <coughs> mobile phones. Because these things, yeah, okay, they don't reap, you know, 50 megabit, 42, whatever, but it's a matter of time before it does get there. The benefits of these things, particularly when it comes to breaking news stories as well, you look at what Sky News are doing, Harriet Hadfield and so on, they're broadcasting live from the scene before you can get your sat truck there. That's where the real value of this stuff is. But also, a well-constructed, a well-shot with someone who knows what they're doing, knows the kit, you cannot <laughs> tell the difference. I, I challenge a normal mm. viewer to tell the difference between something that's shot on a C300, C whatever, mm and one of those, if it's well done yeah. and well produced. And, and were you looking at um, Ken's cornucopia of technology and saying, well, actually, hang on a sec, 360 cameras, drones, cameras I can throw up to things. Are you starting to see some tools there that, that may be in their infancy, but that, that may actually explode your capability of pulling a story in as a mobile journalist? I totally take your point about it needs to be the right tool for the right job. And the number of news stories that you see floating around the internet, drone footage over London. It's not London that's the story, it's the drone mm. that's the story. Yeah. That's going to take a while before the, the novelty of that wears down. I'm sure it'd be the same with 360 video as well, but it's finding the right, the right context, the right, mm. the right mode of storytelling that fits this. BBC's been doing some incredible stuff um, at uh, the camps in Calais around 360 video as well. And you get a sense of exploration. And that's what virtual reality mm. gives you, the sense of presence <coughs> in this environment. <coughs> and naturally, as humans, we do want to explore. And you know, it's a great way of looking around when you do have one of these headsets on. I don't think we're going to get the full cinema thing like the Samsung cinema thing there. People aren't going to do that. I think that's nonsense anyway. I mean, all those people were looking in the same direction. I yes. mean. The right. only reason why a bunch of people would sit in the same place and watch different things at different times and, and see the scene would be because the popcorn was good there. <laughs> <laughs> really. I, I mean... I, I was watching it thinking, how many of them were sick afterwards? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's, there were people going around with... Uh, no, no, they weren't. With can, can I get sick something? Bags. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to add something because I think it's a bit unfair to, to address all, the, all, all these questions simply to these things that we see here. Yeah. Because these are not really the, the tools that we would expect professionals from, from a TV station or people like us that we are producing mm. 360 for much bigger quality than the average phone to use. There are uh, tools like that that are on, on the professional level and that produce 4K, they produce pretty good pictures, that they have very good quality. So we will not really expect the professionals to use the consumer-based toolkit. Yeah. So to, to answer the question of whether it's a matter of quality or not, even today it's not really a matter of quality because we have tools and we have been using tools like that for more than five years now, only they're not on the table yeah. and not on this price range. Mm -hmm. and so they're on IBC, that. not CES. Uh, they're, they're big industrial yes, versions yes. of this. I mean, the, ca the cameras yeah. we use in, in our own company uh, cost 15,000 each mm. and uh, then you, you need 20 more thousand to add software and stuff to them. Yeah. But they are nowhere near the, the consumer level of this, uh, yep. totally different tools. Like a red camera is not the same as the camera that you find on the iPhone. Yep. So I think it's a bit unfair because the, the 360 toolkit 
will be different for the different type of people that will use it. I think the, 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 the interesting thing that we all need to consider is what kind of content is going to be produced by using this kit. And the consumers will produce easier content, holiday maker kind of mm. films, and we all know of the kind of horrific VHS tapes that people came back from their holidays that nobody wanted to watch. Yep. There will be lots of them in 360, yep. so it will be even more horrific. My wedding video. <laughs> yeah. But yes, but they will be incredibly good stories in 360 made by great professionals and incredible good mm. artists, storytellers that uh, will find ways to express themselves that they cannot have today. Let me give you one little example and I will finish with this. M many cinematographers consider how they're going to put their viewer inside the story itself. So sometimes they will um, release and they will give some clues to the viewer that the actors don't have. Now, can you imagine that with the, with the multiple um, view 360 kind of, uh, of artwork of, uh, of film, you could actually be in there and receive the clues and be in the, in the scene itself. Mm. Which comes back to kind of the viewing experience yes. as the gentleman was hinting yes, at. Yes, and, and yeah. the gentleman at the back, he, he yeah. also mentioned this co-viewing experience. Mm. But the co-viewing experience may be from different positions in the same story. But it has to be done with the intention that that's what you Oh, yes, yes, like, yes. It's yes. like the theatre yes. experience that you're it talking about. It will about. have to be with it, the intention. It's done because that's intended. <clears throat> yep. That's the way that they want it to be. Yep. Rather than, as I've said yep. before, you know, the shoehorning <laughs> into where we're doing this and we'll add this on the side. That, that's where I think it's going to fall Exactly. Down. Otherwise, it will fail. Yeah. And I, I think storytellers will need, or directors, will need to, to find a completely new language of, of, of cues. Because, for example, in, if I am in a, in a 360 space, I don't want to be lost. Because here, I, I, I'm listening to something back there. I get a, a cue from Ken. So I'm going to turn and look at Ken because something happened. Now the director has to be careful with all these cues that until today were restricted in a little panel and now they're going to be 360. So if, if they're going to direct me to, to watch the 360, uh, uh, how can I call this, the 360 experience in the correct way, in the way that it was meant to be, then they have to give me cues. They have to have something going blink back here so I'll turn around. I mean, cinematographers do that all the time anyway. I hope the people from Ravensbourne are listening to this, because uh, because this, this is these are the kind of things we need taught into into the new mm -hmm. filmmaking. I'm going to take a question here at the front. Um, I'm conscious of time. If, if am I allowed to take two more questions? I'm looking at Terry at the back. She's saying just two more questions. I take one here and this gentleman here. And then what, whilst these questions are coming in, I'm going to ask you just to kind of think of a, a, a just a sum up statement of, of what we're seeing. If there was one idea you wanted to throw out to the crowd, so so this gentleman here first, and then the last question will be the gentleman with his arm up at the back, sir. <laughs> okay. uh, my name's Scott Hope, um, commercial director at AR Experiential. We're a specialist agency in the event sector. Um, just on the theme of the we and the me, um, I mean, my perspective is, first of all, experience. We've used that word a lot. It is all about the experience. You know, the technology should be seamless in, in whatever the use case is. Now, my take on it is if you're going to produce some 360 video content, you make it accessible on the, the traditional home viewing device, which is the good old television, and on the virtual reality headset. Mm. And I think uh, when we talk about use cases, I know you're just offering alternative regards drama, uh, but I think uh, reality TV and fly on the wall documentaries are a great opportunity for when the, the viewer actually wants to be a part of the action themselves. I think that's particularly the case with reality TV and and, mm. um, and uh, fly on the wall. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I've read some research recently about uh, not so much about the 360, but about you know TV viewing generally on other devices. You know, and um, you know we've got uh, you can view TV on your phone, you can view it on your tablet. Uh, overwhelmingly, still, I think 97% of people still want to view TV on a television set. Mm. So you know, yeah, you're going to have tech-savvy people interested in all this stuff, but you need to appeal to the masses, and the masses is the non-tech-savvy uh, viewer. They're still going to want to use the traditional television set way into the future, I believe, so you need to be able to accommodate them. I don't think anyone's suggesting that this stuff is going to change all of television, but I think what I'm starting to hear is that there are, there are contexts and opportunities to do new things which, which, which add to the, the, the variety of, of, of outcomes on telly, um, which, is, which is quite exciting. Um, I was, I'll take this last question. Um, Hi, it's more of a 
kind of a kind can of I just have a, a name and a oh sorry yeah, yeah name them <coughs> all of that stuff. Right. Um, my name's Simon Jackson. I'm from UK TV. Okay. Um, it's more of a comment than a question. It was basically referring back to what that gentleman said about um, VR being about uh, being more like a book. Mm. And I think, and very also, and also referring back to um, what uh, Sorel is it? Yes. Yeah, said about um, she liked the things that were uh, basically to do with your phone. And I think your phone is a very personal thing. It's what you carry around with you all the time. And it's not really a shared viewing experience. And I was just wondering, basically, if maybe the future of VR and 360 viewing and that sort of thing is more like a book, and you have your Google Cardboard or something very cheap, which is easily accessible for, by, for most people, and you put your phone into that, and you view your VR experience, or your 360 experience, mm. and that is for you, for a viewer, for one person, Yep. with the book, and that is the direction it will go, rather than being everybody trying to shoehorn the shared experience mm. into it. It's and on other occasions you may sit with your family and watch normal telly, yeah. other occasions yeah, you may yeah. pull up... This is just a, a new VR. experience, yeah. this is just a new thing, and I don't think it necessarily harms the viewing experience, mm. because it's for you, and I don't, and I don't think it really... It, it's, it's there for new storytellers to tell new stories, specifically yep. for this type of... So it of adds to the mix, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah that's it. Anyway, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll work this way. Final, okay. final thoughts. Final right. thoughts. Um, I, I think that a lot of this stuff is really exciting. And, you know, I think it'd be good to, to be in a position where actually we could sort of set up some sort of project, research project or something like that across the industry where we could look at how we use these things and, and how we sort of adapt our techniques in order to be able to use them effectively. Mm. I mean, you know, the 3D example, as soon as you go into 3D, all the sort of depth clues that we used to introduce as a technique in 2D, so occlusion and tone and lighting and differential focus and all those sorts of things, that they change. That whole environment changes. Hollywood have just launched a big um, research project looking at the whole VR piece and uh, where does that fit and how do we use that? And I think having one for the television industry would be great. So if, if there's anybody out there could set up something <laughs> like that, I think that's what I'd love to see. You know, how do we use these things? How do we use them effectively? The BBC got 400 people working on it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> They'll lead the field. <laughs> we, we'll follow. Yeah. So they can spend all their money on it. We'll just follow behind. <laughs> yeah, I was joking. But... <laughs> Anthony. Okay, I'm, I'm going to restrict myself talking about TV. Now, uh, restriction is only on what TV is. Because... Uh, uh, what we cannot uh, uh, disagree is that people do not today watch television only on TV screens. They will watch it on laptops, they will watch it on tablets, and they will watch it on mobiles. Now the question is, should the TV be exactly the same in all of these? And I think the answer obviously is no. Mm. Because there's a lot of difference between this screen there and my screen here. Because on this screen here I can do this. Mm. And if I can do this, television must allow me to do something by that. Otherwise, the capability that, that I have here is lost. Mm. And the reason that many of these uh, um, little tools, as I said, in a more professional uh, level, should be applied by television into ex enhancing the, the, the kind of programming that we see today in ways that we may not know still how it's going to be applied to. Uh, it should be applied for all the other different distribution um, devices and uh, display devices that are not the same as a TV screen. Okay. So on, on my mobile, I would like to be able to choose the angle from which I'm watching something or choose something to come on top of the content. So different devices and different viewing contexts yes. will drive different content forms relevant to... So, so I think okay. all this content that will come from devices like that will be enhancing the TV experience, bringing yep. it to a new level for the different uh, display devices that we'll have in our pocket. Thank you. Sarah, final uh, thoughts? I think the main thing that I've got from today is that it's changing. Our, everything, we've sort of got boxes at the moment. Um, and with new technology, we're sort of breaking out of those boxes. Um, and like you were saying about people creating and writing things that will allow this technology to flourish and really grow. Um, so I think that's the main thing I've got from today. And I just think that 
I think it was your company that was filming the rock concert. Yep. I mean, that's sort of, that, that's where it's going. I mean, I was talking, I can't remember who it was, <coughs> saying that I would love to have watched, have watched Beyonce at the Super Bowl with my, you know, virtual, and that to me, I can then tweet about it and have this experience with other people and talk about sort of yeah. what I've seen. Mm. So I think that's definitely where it is going. Um, how willing us digital natives uh, <laughs> are going to accept it is another thing. But it's just, I do see it going in that direction. Okay. I noticed you didn't mention Chris Martin at the Super Bowl. <laughs> <but yeah. laughs> well, I'll say you will accept or discard very, very rapidly. And so if, I, if mm. there's any advice here, it's watch consumers. Consumers are watching broadcast stuff, now watch consumers, because this puts it in the realm yeah. mm -hmm. where they're going to create some very stupid stuff, some very boring stuff, and some new genres, some new capabilities that are going to come out of the woodwork. And also, storytellers, news reporters that are using this because they can do something they didn't, couldn't do before, are coming up with new stories because it, you couldn't get the crew there, you couldn't, it cost too much money. So I, that's, I'm a consumer advocate. I believe in, I've seen it and I, I'm looking at consumer driven change. So I'm not so much believing in the couch potato as the swivel chair mm. potato. But I also notice that my family, my friends, uh, we're closer than we ever were before and we don't all live in the same house, yet we are closer than we were before. So this gives us Yep. Some mediums to socialize. Uh, I'm not selling any of this stuff. No, I know, yeah. I'm <laughs> curious. No, and, I, and actually, I, I must admit, it's kind of my wrap up statement. I, I, listening to Sorel, quite how welcoming you were of all that stuff on the table, and you're, you were saying you, you can fully anticipate um, using bits of that. I think that the consumer impact isn't necessarily that they're going to make content that, that affects the TV industry. I think what's interesting is their expectations of what video is mm -hmm. from their own construction will change. And so they will expect yep. the TV industry to reflect their own changing perceptions of it. So over time, we will have a more <coughs> digitally literate and interactive and VR literate audience who will expect to see their expectations change. In the same way that I, I no longer worry about seeing um, handheld mobile video in a news story, because I make it myself so I can see it, I think over time our, our personal use changes our perceptions of what we expect the TV industry um, to deliver. I mean, I have to say, I, I thought tonight was, was, was um, much more positive than, than I expected. And, and I, I came away with two kind of broad things, areas to think about. One is that um, content can change. But there are both craft skills and industry skills which can be brought to bear in these new environments. And your points about cues and structures and standards, um, those things don't get thrown away because of this stuff. What we need as an industry is to work out the, the how to change, why to change content, what we're trying to do with it, and then how to apply those things into that new world. So content can change. And then the second thing, which based on the gentleman's point and, and, very, and, and Solomon's point at the back there, was actually our, our understanding of context of viewing may change. Where my, the perception of we was always just people on the sofa. We may, over time, because of this stuff, change what we, how we consider an audience. TV has always understood audience. Audience was made up of family on a sofa times 19 million. Um, and that's what we thought was an audience. Actually, our perception of audience may change because VR allows us to experience things as a group. And, and your comment there about um, your perception of audience with your Twitter um, followers together. Um, and, and we may have to redefine what we think as the TV audience I mean, how we structure, which I actually think is quite exciting. So, I mean, there's a lot of students in the room and the kind of younger parts of our industry. I'm guessing, as we look forward, that all of this stuff, if we get the answers right, actually heralds a very exciting time to be in TV. Um, so I want to um, ask you just to thank my panellists for, for doing that and also thank yourselves for the questions. Um, welcome. Brilliant. Brilliant.